Larry Bowes is somebody that we have been partnering with in a work in Athens, Greece. And uh, Larry and Kathy uh, have several, for several years now worked with refugees. Uh, and so the folks that are coming out of Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, all those areas, that thousands of them, the people don't know what to do, and they end up in Athens. And so uh, God has given Larry and Kathy a mission there. And it's exciting because to see so many people being converted out of Islam. I mean, just so many. And then as they leave there, going up into Europe and converting more folks. And so uh, who knows, maybe the Lord's going to re-evangelize that whole part of the country through the ones you guys are converting there. But uh, we're so grateful for your work and your ministry. And uh, uh, preach the word to us, brother. I will. I will. And I like this movable. Uh, I, are I, you on? I'm on. I am on. He just set me a little bit. Is he on? I like this movable pulpit. That way, if people run out, you can just chase them out in the parking lot with it and just keep preaching. So this is great. It's great to be back at WFR Church. Uh, it is fantastic. Kathy and I, raise your hand, show them who we are. That's my Kathy right there. Uh, we consider ourselves part of the WFR family, even if we don't show up but once a year. You probably have other members that do that, so it's okay. <laughs> so... <coughs> In Athens, it's kind of the epicenter of the refugee flow. We have encountered Muslim refugees from 22 different Muslim countries standing right in that spot. It's like standing in that doorway. Places you couldn't get in, the Lord's just bringing them to you. It's amazing. Another thing very similar happened to that. By the way, there's more displaced war, displaced people in the world today than at the height of World War II. A lot of people don't know that. But in the mid-1930s, there was a young German theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he found himself in the middle of a refugee flow because his country and his world was in chaos. His country was under the ideology of a madman and began to invade countries around, and he had refugees walking through his door looking for life. And he looked around at his church and he saw no life. And he said, something is wrong. And he began to preach a very radical message. And it caused a lot of problems. And he was ultimately banned from his church because he became too radical when he said things like, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. When I say the word radical, what do you think of? What word do you hear? Let's look at what it actually says. This is an adjective of or going to the root of origin, fundamental or a radical difference, thoroughgoing, pervasive, extreme, especially as regards change from accepted ways or traditional norms. When I think of the words that the Apostle Paul used to describe this idea, I think he said that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. He said, no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the way you think, feel, act, respond to the world around you. Jesus in John chapter 3 told Nicodemus that you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter unless you are born again. And starting in verse 14, he said, just as number 21, Moses raised that snake up on the pole, I'm going to die and I will be high and lifted up and the only way out is through faith. For God so loved the world that he gave me that whoever believed in me would not die, but have life, life and death. For God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world because the world already stood condemned to death because of sin. Jesus absolutely said the most radical thing.
He said that following him was such a matter of life and death that if your eye causes you to stumble while following, gouge it out and throw it away. He said if your hand causes you to stumble while trying to follow him, cut it off and throw it away because it's, go, it's better to go through this world maimed than to have your whole body thrown into hell. In John chapter 6, he says, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. It's like what Mike was talking about. He said, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. And people said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? It's too radical. And many people turned away and no longer followed Jesus. In Matthew 10, he says, if you acknowledge me before others, I'm going to acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you disown me, I'm going to disown you. Don't think that I have come to bring peace. Isn't that what we pray for? We long for? He said, I didn't come to bring that. I came to bring division, a sword. I will separate a man from his son. I will separate a mother from a daughter. I am going to separate families. Your enemies will be the members of people that live in your house. Luke 9, he says, if you put your hand to the plow, follow me, and you look back, you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. That's radical. Dietrich is just saying exactly what Jesus is. Grace and salvation is offered freely to anyone who will follow Jesus. But Jesus says, following me is going to cost you your I never really considered myself a very radical person. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, isn't it interesting, though, how different events in your life, single moments, just a few words somebody might say to you can kind of really transform the trajectory of your life? And you don't really realize what's going on until you get down the road. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I am not the smartest guy that you're ever going to meet not the brightest bulb in the box for some reason the movie Forrest Gump just spoke to me <laughs> I'm not a smart man but I know what love is I was a fireman for 25 years I was a captain of the Tulsa Fire Department and I learned a lot of 25 years in emergency management, I learned a lot about life and death because that was the business I was in. I worked on the 10th busiest rescue company in the United States. I was a paramedic. Two or three people a week died with my hands on them. I was a high angle rescue technician. I worked the Oklahoma City bombing in 95. Search and rescue was my business. And even a guy like me could make the connection that that was Jesus' business, too, because he was in the business of seeking to save the lost. So I always knew why I was risking my life when I went to work every day because greater love has no man than he would lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. But I haven't always been like I am to date. I was literally not raised to be a fireman. I was raised to be a member of the church. Not just any church, but a member of the Church of Christ. I can remember I was seven years old. It was 1966. We got home from church in time for me to see gun smoke. It was awesome. And so I went and I got my footy pajamas on and I got me a big bowl of, of Captain Crunch. You know, just tear up the roof of your mouth. And I sat in front of our Zenith black and white TV and I watched it. It was awesome. And my mom's in the kitchen and she's doing dishes and the show ends and the tea. And I just keep watching and on comes a Billy Graham crusade. Never seen one before. Never even heard of Billy Graham. And I watched. And my mom heard what was on the TV and she left the kitchen and came in and turned off the TV. And I said, what? She said, we're not going to watch that. I said, why are we not going to watch that? Well, it's, it's okay. We're just not going to watch it. I said, mom, he was talking about Jesus. 
And there were thousands of people, and Billy was telling people about Jesus. He said, well, we're not going to watch it because he's not a member of the church. And I said, oh, I didn't get it. And later on, I went to song leading school, and I learned how to guide garden to direct us and bring us back at the next appointed hour. And I was baptized when I was 10. And when I was 12, my dad became an elder. And when I would leave for school every morning, my parents would say, remember who you are, not talking about my identity in Christ, but reminding me that if I screwed up, it would bring reproach on my dad because he was an elder in the church. And I didn't get it. I went to Oklahoma Christian, and Kathy shamelessly pursued me until I married her. <laughs> and we got married, and we had kids, so then I qualified to be a deacon, and I became a deacon at 25 because I was supposed to. And Kathy was the church secretary. Six months later, we had this massive church split, and it was a bloodbath. And the two ministers came out and got in a go-to-hell cuss fight in front of my wife, and she came home devastated. And I saw elders inviting each other out of a meeting into the parking lot to finish it. And my little church world fell apart. I've never told this publicly. Forgive me. I was raised in the church, but I did not know Christ. I had a physical manifestation of an emotional breakdown. Now I'm lying in my bed and I cry out and I say, Jesus, I don't even know if you're real. If you're real, I need to know and I need to know now. Jesus showed up. And that's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> but in John 14, 21, he says exactly this. I will come to you I will reveal myself to you and he revealed himself to me and I can never ever deny him again and that night something in me broke and I was changed and before that I could not talk in front of people I'd be sitting in a Bible class Kathy will testify to this the preacher would ask me to read five verses. I would get through one and I would have this panic attack and I couldn't breathe and I would get up and leave the room. It was so embarrassing. But after that, guess what? I could talk in front of people. You couldn't shut me up. And I talked about Jesus. I'm a one-string banjo. I play one song. It's about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Now I'm teaching the Bible classes. I'm in a 12-week series on the Gospel of John. The elders call me out of the class into a meeting and say, Larry, you're out of control. We believe you need to apply some balance. There's more to talk about than just Jesus. We're worried that, about this Jesus phase that you're in. And I said, guys, I think it's not a phase. I think it's a progressive disorder. <laughs> I'm worried that it might be terminal. In fact, I hope that it is. Ten years later, I get a call from a preacher friend of mine who just happens to be the head of the Bible department at a university in Virginia. And he calls me, he says, Larry, I want you to come and do a campus crusade. And I said, Bob, I've never done anything like that. He said, just come. You'll speak at chapel, you're preaching tonight, whatever. Okay, wh what do you want me to talk about? He said, Larry, I've heard you speak. I said, what do you want me to talk about? He said, I don't care what you talk about. These kids just need to hear you talk. I said, Bob, you're the smartest guy I've ever known in my life, but that was like the dumbest thing I've ever heard you say. He wasn't mad for long, so I was able to go anyway. Uh, so I go up there, I speak at chapel. <clears throat> and I'm preaching at night, and I come off the platform one morning. He said, what are you doing now? And I said, I flew a thousand miles. I don't know what I'm doing here. You tell me what it is I'm supposed to do. He said, I want you to teach a class. I said, I don't have anything prepared. And he says to me, <clears throat> 
uh, it, you know, just, it's a class. I want you to teach it. And I said, when is it? And he said, in 45 minutes. I said, how long is it? And he said, it's at three hours. And I said, what kind of class? It's a post-grad theology class. I said, I've never even been in a post-grad theology class. And he looks at me and literally takes his hand and goes like this. He goes, just go in there and teach something about Jesus. So I'm like, now that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard anybody say. And so I thought, Lord, what am I going to do? And so I thought, I'll just do the upper room discourse. I start in John 13. I go to John 17. Three hours just blowing and going. Nobody left. Nobody fell asleep. And when I got done, there's a, a young girl, a fifth-year MDiv student, comes up to me and turns her head sideways and looks me in the eye, and she says, I'll never forget this. You really believe this, don't you? I said, this is so sad. She said, I've never had a professor that I believe really thought he believed what he was talking about. And I said, how can you proclaim the passion of Jesus Christ with no passion? Like it's some kind of textbook. This is life and death that Jesus is talking about. No, I am not radical. I'm not smart, but I'm passionately in love with my Jesus. Amen. I'm going to show you some really radical people. Here's two of them. That girl in the One Kingdom t-shirt, that's my Kathy. <laughs> this other guy is a name, his name is Hadi, Hadi Hosseini. He's from Herat, Afghanistan. He's a radical brother in Christ. And I'm going to tell you a little about them. Where we're standing is on Lesbos Island. And Lesbos Island is one of three primary entry islands just off the uh, coast of Turkey. You can see the arrow pointing there. We're standing right where the tip of that arrow is. This is where uh, millions and millions of refugees flow from the Middle East. They come through Turkey. Istanbul's right in the top corner. And so that Lesbos entry island, that beach that we're standing on is less than a mile from the Turkish coast. Uh, this is what that beach looked like in 2009 when Hadi hit it. This is the exact place that he landed. If you see up in the right, that's Turkey right there. It's that close. These are life jackets that the refugees abandoned as they hit the beach. In 2015, almost one million in 12 months hit this beach, each one with a life jacket. Nearly 3,000 lost their lives trying to get there, but the balance made it. They began to pick up these life jackets, and they made a landfill right over the hill from this beach, and I'm going to try to show you what this looked like. I don't even know how to begin to tell you how to describe what 1.2 million life jackets look like. And so I found some aerial drone photography, and this is about 30 feet high, 20 to 30 feet high, about two football fields in this. And these are, whoops, I did it. I hit the wrong button. Sorry, brother. Thank you. And uh, these are those those life jackets piled up. The flow has stopped because now uh, they had, do have some border uh, force boats that, uh, and we, we saw one here. Most of the crossings come at night, but they still slip through about 500 a week, about 2,000 a month. So the flow is still coming. Hadi took us back there and he said, you know, maybe my life jacket's here. And he stood there in Kathy's arms and he says, I was trying to save my life. But I lost my life when I found Jesus. We met Hadi in 2012 in a circle like this. That's a young, young, much younger, much less gray me. That's only seven years ago. See so what refugee ministry will do. Look at, look at Mike's hair. See that? What y'all do to him? 
And I'm sitting there, and I'm a one-string banjo, sitting there playing my little Jesus song, and Hottie is in, in one of these groups, and he is shy and backward and doesn't say very much, but I can tell that there's something that he's looking for. And so I invite him to a week-long camp about an hour and a half outside of Athens, and he comes, and uh, we study the Bible together, and at the end of the week, he knows Jesus. And so we began to, we baptized 12, I think, that year. Uh, we give them opportunity to share their testimony. So Hadi gets up, and he doesn't really share his testimony. He begins to preach. You can see him. He's doing this thing like I do. And so we get down to the water, and he's still preaching. I'm standing in the water waiting for him to get in the water. It's like Hadi get in the water. He's still preaching. So he comes back the, the next year, sorry, he comes back the next year and he, he, he brings seven guys to Christ, baptizes them. He comes back to Athens with us and I said in Athens we get a lot of refugees from all over the world. We've had refugees from Louisiana that come in and Hadi ministered to them. Uh, and, and so he was there. He comes back to Athens with us and he is one of our first eight Acro Center students. Uh, but before this class, he decided to make a trip back to Lesbos and met this guy. His name's Amir Dad. And on Lesbos, on November 9th, 2015, this is off Amir Dad's Facebook page. This is his profile pic, is that bench. Hadi found him on that bench and shared Jesus with him. And that's where Amir Dad lost his life, but he found it when he found Jesus. And now, my dad works with us at the Acro Center. We support him full time in ministry. See all that electronic stuff that is sitting in front of him? You know where that came from? One year ago, this month, I was in that room over there on a Wednesday night. And I got through speaking, and y'all took two chicken buckets and passed it around that room. And I left here with a check for $2,400. So I went back and bought this camera. My dad is a trained computer science guy from the University of Tehran. He's a gifted videographer. He had been shooting videos on a cell phone. Now he's got a Canon XA30. He's got wireless mics. I built light boxes out of laundry tubs. I bought studio furniture and a green screen. And in 12 months, they have produced 150 discipleship videos in English and Farsi language that are being beamed. <laughs> into Afghanistan, Iran, all over the Muslim-speaking world. There is 22, 23 hours of Javad and I teaching on the deity of Christ, on the biblical basis of the doctrine of the Trinity, all of the camp curriculum. Everything that I've ever do in Athens is now worldwide. Anything you say, canon will be used you against you in a Sharia court of law. I'm just saying. So I'm, we're out there. It's scary. We get death threats, but let me tell you what's happening. They get 10,000 hits a month on four channels, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Telegram. They got four guys sitting there doing nothing but answering questions and leading people to Jesus Christ over the Internet. Thousands have come to Christ. Chicken buckets just ain't for chicken, apparently. These guys are animals. They are the most radical people I know. Their life in Christ has cost them absolutely everything, and this is what they do with it. When my dad is not doing that, he is now teaching the basic level Acro Center curriculum. Oh, but wait, the girl in the corner, who's that? That's a girl he met on the streets in Athens. Her name is Shermina. She came to the Acro Center. She led her 17-year-old son to Christ. Why does a woman that young have a 17-year-old son? Because she was sold by her father when she was 11 to sell, to pay a debt. As a fourth wife, became a sex slave. She was pregnant when she was 12. She was able to escape. She took her son and got out. And she found Jesus. Now she's on the videos telling other people how to share their faith. 
But we're not talking about all of that. We're talking about Hadi, right? So here's Hadi, and he comes back, and he comes through all the advanced level classes. He's helping me preach. We're hanging out, and beginning of last year, 2018, he comes to Kathy and I, and he says, I feel like the Lord's calling me back to Lesbos. I'm moving there full time. So with all these refugees flying into Lesbos, there's got to be something going on there. And this is called Camp Moria. This is what the United Nations High Council on Refugees currently calls the worst situation on the planet. This is a camp that is built for 2,000. It's got 10,000 refugees in it. There's an ISIS presence there. Women are raped there daily. There's a Sharia law court that they have there. It is a mess. Hadi steps into that environment every single day to share Jesus Christ. And he meets somebody and he takes them to a facility about a five minute walk away and he sits down, he teaches them about Jesus and he baptizes them. He was there two months, he calls me, he says, I've got 40 new believers, I need help teaching. We load up a bunch of stuff, Kathy and I go down and we do a class on the deity of Christ. That's the only song I play. Kathy fixes lunch for 40 on nothing but a hot plate. She's got two refugee, refugees that live in the camp helping her. But we got to do it before class starts because they're in the class. These are some of the students. I'm going to tell you quickly about three of them. These are the two guys that were helping Kathy cook. This is Mansoud and Ali. You can see the border control boat right between their heads you know, sitting out in the bay. It's an amazing picture. They made it. They made it through and they found Jesus. And the reason I took them out to lunch this day is because this is Katara. She was in our class. Hadi baptized her three months earlier, baptized her husband, baptized her two sons because she was leaving the next day because she was being moved on a government ferry out of Lesbos to Thessaloniki. So she goes to Thessaloniki. Two weeks later, she, she gets a, a phone call to Hadi. She calls Hadi and says, I've got five people up here that need to be baptized. He said, baptize me. She said, I don't know how. So Hadi leaves, goes up there, ends up, they baptized 12 that day. He leaves Mansud and Ali running things. They're refugees living in Moria camp. They baptize four while he's gone three days. I want you to look at that. I don't want you to miss this. Because you know what that is? That's good soil. This is Luke 8, exactly what is happening. It would go something like this. A Forrest Gump fireman went out playing his one-string banjo. And he was slinging it with both hands, and a lot of what he did didn't amount to anything, but some of it, without even him knowing it, hit some good soil. And it came up and yielded a crop that was a hundred times what was sown. And Jesus goes on to explain in 15... This good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, and they do three things with it. They hear the word, they retain it, and through discipleship, somebody saying, keep your eyes on Jesus. By following Jesus, they persevere. And just like John 15, if you abide in me, you're going to bear fruit. You can't help it, because that is exactly how the kingdom of God works. At the Acro Center, we've got a saying that says that we're looking for those that are looking for Jesus. Of the thousands of people that we've seen come to Christ, I have never led anyone to Christ that wasn't looking for him. Jesus had already found them before I did. They come to me looking for Jesus. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. He is still seeking and saving. He's doing it in the darkest parts of this world, Iran, Afghanistan, and he is doing it in West Monroe, Louisiana. Look for good soil. 
Just look at the ones that are coming through your door because they're looking for life. And be honest with them that life following Jesus is going to cost them their life. This is not religion. This is not the Christian religion. This is the Christian life. This is the glory of Jesus living in us. I want to talk about the Apostle Peter. A Peter would have been a fireman, not a fisherman, given the opportunity. I'm positive of it. Because just like me, and Kathy testified to this, she has to, I just don't pick up on things. I have to be told two, three, four times sometimes. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is teaching, and he is saying that I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, scribes. I'm going to be killed, and on the third day I will rise. And Jesus spoke this message quite frankly. Can you imagine? And Peter took him aside. Peter took the Lord of glory, you know, the heaven of, you know, Lord of heaven and earth, and he said, come here, I need to talk to you. This is not going to go down this way. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. You're thinking with your own thought. Did Jesus call Peter Satan? I don't think so. I think he's talking to Satan, and he's saying... Get, he didn't say get behind Peter because Satan just been on Peter's back. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because Peter could not see Jesus. When we stand in people's way who are trying to get to Jesus, telling them about Jesus, we are speaking in the voice of the world. We are speaking for Satan. Get out of the way and let them get to Jesus. Let, you don't tell people about Jesus. You show them Jesus alive in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> In this very next breath, Jesus says this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Take up their cross, which is meaning you've died, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life is going to lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the sake of the gospel will save it. It took Peter two or three times to get it. But Jesus, in his third appearance to the disciples, Jesus had been denied by Peter three times, and he has three questions for Peter. And in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? You ever wonder who these are? Who are the these? What's well, the ten other guys who had just eaten the fish that Jesus cooked? He said, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, I love you. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Again, do you love me? Yes, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep. Simon, son of John, what? Do you love me? You know that I love you. Hurt deeply. He says, feed my sheep. They're my sheep. They're not your sheep. You, you feed them. You get out of their way. You lead them to me. You feed them me. You reveal who I am to them. And Peter, and then verse 19, just get it, Peter. Finally, get it. Follow me. If you just follow me, you will lead people to Christ. It's not that hard. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25, Paul 
said, I became a slave. I became a servant by the commission of God. He gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. It's a mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations. It is now disclosed. And he said, this mystery is nothing less than Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then he gives us five things I want to point out quickly. What is it that they do? We proclaim Him. If you proclaim anything other than Jesus Christ, you're not proclaiming Christ. And he says we admonish, we teach. What does it mean to admonish? To beg and plead someone to not let go of Jesus. In a rescue, I had a guy hanging on a bar and I'm pleading from the ground, don't let go or you'll die. That's admonishment. And we teach them who Jesus is with all wisdom. What wisdom? Our wisdom? No. With godly wisdom. James 1.5, it says to ask God for wisdom. The reason we don't have wisdom, Jesus says, is because we don't ask. All we have to do is ask. And we do it so that what? So that everyone is mature in Christ. Do not allow people you disciple to be dependent on you. Don't be Jesus to them. Get out of their way and show them Jesus. We want to see every Christian in every church, in any context, in every language buried so deeply in Christ that any storm could roll into their life and they will never come out. <laughs> to this end, I strenuously contend, labor, strive, strain, toil, struggle. What is the work? Jesus was asked this, what must we do in John chapter 6 to do the works of God? Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. Following Jesus is the work. That's the only work you need to do is believe in Jesus. Follow Jesus. He will bring the growth. And here's the strength. With all of his energy working so powerfully in me, I get out of his way, I get out of their way, I show people Jesus, and he says that salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. We're about to have an invitation. Some churches call this an altar call. You know what happens on an altar? Death happens on an altar sacrifice happens on an altar shedding of blood happens on an altar are you going to tell me that you can walk in here come to this altar eat his flesh and drink his blood and walk away intact The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the very power of God unto salvation. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. I am not ashamed to be deficient and broken, and I want to bear evidence of my life bearing the marks of death that I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but that Jesus Christ lives in me, and this life that I live in this body, this life I live in this body, I live by one thing, and that is faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me if you have heard Jesus tell you today that something in you needs to die come now as we stand and sing